Welcome to the private real estate deal, keeping it simple and saving money. I'm Jim Cunningham. I am an attorney in California, and this is not legal advice. My, I'm a lawyer. My lips are moving. Do not look at this and then go out and do a bunch of stuff and say, well, I saw this video or went to a webinar and, um, and I'm going to do this based on the information in here. Really, this is just purely information only. If you're watching this on YouTube, subscribe to our YouTube page. We do, if you're watching this live, there's a Q&A button. You can put your questions in the Q&A. And if you're watching this on YouTube, you can actually post a, a comment in the comment section and we do, um, we do re respond to those comments. Again, I'm the managing partner of Cunningham Legal. I'm a certified specialist in estate planning, trust and probate law. I've got over 25 years of trust and estate experience. We have offices in the San Francisco Bay, Southern California and capital regions. I'm also a securities and insurance licensed and a licensed real estate broker. Now I don't sell anything terms of securities and insurance or, or real estate, but I am licensed. So I do have um, a little bit deeper understanding of this. So what is a private real estate deal? So this is what we're talking, what we're talking about here is many times clients will call and they'll say, Jim, I want to sell to a family member or a neighbor or a tenant who has an option to buy. Can you help us with that real estate transaction? So if you know each other and you basically, you know, agreed on a price and some basic terms, Sometimes it's really good to opt out of the traditional uh, real estate uh, sales professional role because they do charge a commission and those commissions, they vary, but generally in California, they're five to 6%. And so some people say, look, we've already sold the property. We need someone to shepherd this through the escrow. So that's what we're talking about here. This is property that is not listed on a multiple listing service. Now in California, there's something called the multiple listing service. And I will tell you, and I'm gonna repeat this, if you're trying to get the highest price, sometimes it's best to go through a multiple listing service. In fact, generally it is. So certainly with residential, you're exposing the property to a much broader marketplace, but we're really not talking about that. We are going to cover residential, multifamily, commercial, industrial, and as well as ag and ranch land. So very, very important. So we're not talking about a for sale by owner, right? Um, we're not talking about, you know, I'm going to put up a, a FISBO for sale by owner uh, sign on my house. And Jim, I want you to help me with that. I, I'm not talking about that. We're not talking about the discount houses. You know, Redfin, you see them advertised, will list your house uh, for 1%. That's not what we're talking about. Um, so we're not talking about when it's listed on the MLS. We are also not talking about sales of LLC interest. So that's covered by Reg D. And that's a securities transaction, which is not a real estate transaction. And we'll touch on that toward the end. Um, so we are... Uh, again, seller and buyer know each other. Let's talk about this. The seller and the buyer know each other. What are some common instances where the seller and the buyer would know each other? Um, well, I will tell you one of the, uh, one of the biggest uh, situations in here is buying a sibling out after a uh, family member has passed away. So mom and dad die. And what if you want to buy your sibling out? You're like, you know, mom and dad had that house and I want to buy it, but I got to buy out my siblings. You're not really going to list that on the multiple listing service. It doesn't even make sense, right? But it makes sense to agree on a price and then make sure that you go through the escrow process. And, and I'll discuss a little bit what the escrow process is later, but it's this third-party intermediary that kind of shepherds the transaction. So, you know, I've got the money, you've got the property. Do I give you the money first, then you give me the deed? Or do you give me the deed first, then I give you the money? Escrow solves that problem. Um, this can be a delicate process, right? Because whenever you're talking about mom and dad dying, you know, it, it can be a difficult process. Prop 13 issues. What I mean by that is parent to child reassessment exclusion. Now that has gone away with Prop 19, but we still do have some legacy estates that we're administering where mom and dad died before uh, February 16th of 2021. Um, again, this is not suitable for listing on, on the multiple listing service. If you're buying out a sibling, right? Maybe on half the property, who the heck is going to buy half a property? No one wants to buy a half or a third or a quarter. It just doesn't happen in the real world. Okay. Um, and this also may be part of an equalization strategy. So if mom and dad have a little bit of money and mom and dad have some property, but they don't balance up so that one kid gets the property and the other beneficiaries, the other kids get cash. What we're talking about is a little bit of a settling up. And so there's some functional problems with that. And we'll, we'll go through that. So Helen wanted to have a revocable living trust. Now we cover revocable living trust in other videos. And if you're like, Jim, I, this is the first time I've even heard of a revocable living trust, revocable living trust, check out our YouTube page. Um, and we've got plenty of videos on that. 
but in our example, the sole asset of the estate is a million dollar home. Now in California, I can tell you a million dollar home might be a really nice home. It might be a shack. It could even be a garage. Okay. So it depends on where it is. But in this case, it's a million dollar home in California. And Sam, by the way, I'm using code words that we use in law school hypotheticals. Hal and Wanda are husband and wife. Sam is the son, Deb is the daughter. You see how that works? So Sam, the son wants to buy out Deb, the daughter, but Sam doesn't have 500,000, right? He didn't have 500,000 laying around. Deb doesn't trust Sam, right? She says, well, I don't want to distribute the property to you, Sam. And then you promise to borrow money and give it to me, right? And even if she did, even if she was on board with it, that probably would be a violation of the terms of the trust. So the trustee wouldn't do it. So the, remember, a trustee is the person in charge of the revocable living trust. When a person passes away, they have to follow the terms of the living trust. They don't have a choice. Those are the instructions. They've got to follow them. If the trust says distribute things equally and Sam wants the house and Deb wants money that doesn't exist, uh, we have to go another way. So... Um, so something to understand, when you buy out a sibling, banks do not lend to trusts in general. And I'm speaking generally, they lend to people. I'm talking about a bank, right? So you go down the street, Wells Fargo Bank, a Union Bank, name, name a bank. They typically don't lend to trusts, they lend to people. They do lend to LLCs, but that's a separate issue. Very few banks, in fact, I don't know any bank that will lend to a trust. So here's, here's an issue. Either Sam buys the residence from the trust, okay? Either Sam buys the residence and uses his 50% inheritance interest as a 50% down payment and gets a, a first deed of trust. In California, a mortgage, we use a deed of trust structure. It allows a lender to take the property back if you don't pay the mortgage without having to go to court. You know, the house, the property sold on the courthouse steps. You might've heard of that. But in this case, Sam can buy the property from the estate and finance it with 500,000. The problem with that is if you are trying to preserve Prop 13, parent to child reassessment exclusion, again, legacy issue. But if you're trying to preserve Prop 13, it won't work if you do it that way. The trust has to go out and borrow the money. It's typically done from a private lender. So in this case, the property is not distributed. The trustee goes out, borrows 500,000, uses the property as collateral, and then distributes the million dollar home with a $500,000 mortgage to Sam and the $500,000 to Deb. Now, it's very important to understand that that's expensive money, all right? This is not a 2.99% 30-year, you know, amortized loan. This is typically more expensive money. So we got a couple of questions here. Um, let's see. Would this include purchasing from a trust? Yes. Uh, Michael asks, I signed my condo over to my brother and he is renting it back to me. He said he will give it to me in his will. However, because of Prop 19, he says my property will be reassessed and I will pay high property taxes. Yeah, Michael, that, that is a, uh, if you transfer ownership to your brother, if that's a change in ownership and it sounds like it was, the property is reassessed. Uh, is there anything you can do? Michael, I don't know. It's possible. Um, it's possible that we could... Uh, do like correctory deed or a correcting deed. And basically you say, well, I didn't really mean to do that. Uh, but that's something where I would definitely call our office and, and set up a time and we can go over your individual situation. Hopefully we can get you out of the pickle that it looks like you're in. So let's, selling to a neighbor, this is another common, uh, I actually did a transaction like this uh, just before COVID hit <clears throat> where mom passed away and, and a neighbor wanted to buy the property out. So Helen wanted a husband and wife die, Ned, which stands for neighbor, right? Ned, the neighbor wants to buy Alan Wanda's home for his grandson, Gary, right? So Alan wanted to live next door to Ned and Ned's like, I'd really like Gary to live next door to me. And hey, uh, can I buy the estate? Can I buy the property from the estate, from the living trust? And in this case, Ned is willing to pay above market value, right? What a normal person, what an independent sort of, you know, third party would pay. Ned's willing to pay a premium because he wants his grandson to live next door to him. Okay, so that's how it's, how it's teed up. But how do you establish market value? How is market value established? Market value is what the property would sell for in the marketplace. The multiple listing service, folks, is the marketplace for residential property, period, stick a fork in it, it's done. That is 
the definitive place where you get market value. And if you want the top price, and this is data in California, properties that are listed on the multiple listing service sell for 13% more on average than properties that are not listed on the multiple listing service. Okay, so it's very important. Um, the question is, will Ned pay more than market value? So in this situation, it might not be a bad idea for the trust to, um, to list the property on the multiple listing service, actually engage a realtor, okay? List the property on the multiple listing service and have Ned buy it that way, right? Because you're gonna be net ahead uh, based on the math, based on the 13% increase. So you pay a 5% commission. So this may be a case where it might be best to actually use the multiple listing service, even though you're, you know, you kind of have a target buyer, um, you know, unless, unless you're comfortable with the price and it's an inside deal. Uh, Norma asks, is a Zillow estimate accurate? Well, I don't know. That's a good question. And I happen to know Norma is a realtor, um, but I don't know. Is Zillow accurate? I, I have no idea. I think what's most accurate is if you market the property, right? I think that's the best way to get a, a but we actually internally, we use Zillow just to estimate, you know, what, what's the approximate value uh, of, the, um, of the property. And Norma answers her own question. Thank you. Zillow is not accurate often. So not often is it accurate. So we have another situation where you have a tenant with a lease option to purchase. So what this means is, uh, you rent a property out to um, a tenant and the tenant says, listen, you know, I'm willing to pay you a little bit more rent if in three years or two years or one year or five years or whatever the term is, I can buy this property for a fixed dollar amount. And so the nice thing about that is you as a landlord, you typically get a premium on your rent, right? So if somebody's willing to pay you, uh, you know, 2000 a month rent, they might be willing to pay you 2,500 a month. So they typically pay you more rent. And that is the consideration or that is the thing of value that is exchanged from the potential buyer, the tenant to the owner in order to have an enforceable contract because an enforceable contract does require offer acceptance and consideration. And consideration is a legal term for something of value that we call typically money. So the tenant has a lease option to purchase the property. Um, and sometimes it's residential, but often it's commercial. And then following an accepted offer, you work closely with um, an escrow company. And in this sense, it doesn't make sense to pay a full commission. You do need somebody to do the legwork of the offer, the acceptance, what are the terms and what are the escrow instructions. And that's the role that our firm fulfills for quite frankly, for, for many transactions where people say, look, I have this tenant, there's an option to buy we need to go through this process of, of selling the property. And so our firm, we draw up the agreement, parties sign it, and then that goes to the escrow company and the transaction closes without having to pay the much higher commissions that you would be seeing on a typical uh, uh, situation where the realtor is putting it on the MLS, the multiple listing service. So um, again, example, Owen, <laughs> Owen means owner. Owen rents a single family residence, Red Acre, to Tom. T is tenant, right? So Owen rents uh, Red Acre to Tom. Tom has an option to buy. Tom needs to secure financing on the property, okay? Owen wants to maximize his return. There's already a fixed price. It doesn't make sense to pay five or 6%. And in our firm, we typically charge one and a half percent for that transaction. So we get the, the legwork done at a reduced rate. And something you need to know, if you go to a normal realtor, right? A national realtor, there's a prohibition on them, typically on them discounting their, their fees to this point. They just don't do it. They're fulfilling a different role. It's not that I'm for or against it one way or another, but in this particular situation, I'm not convinced that paying a five or 6% commission uh, adds much value, to, to be frank with you. Um, and again, I'm just speaking wildly general. This is not legal advice. This does not apply uh, in, in necessarily any situation. But it's just something to be mindful of is there are alternatives. But you know, then again, sometimes there might be a reason to pay a commission, right? If there's a lot of work to be done, again, it just depends on the individual situation. Um, so how much does your firm charge, Susan? We typically charge one and a half percent. If you get, if it's higher, if it's a bigger dollar amount, then there are break points. But for most transactions, it's it's one and a half percent. So, um, and by the way, the larger the transaction typically the lower and especially when you get into commercial and industrial you might see commissions under one percent you know if you're talking a 50 million dollar building or something 
Um, so what if you don't have an option to buy? So the tenants, um, they can just buy the property, right? Um, but oftentimes a tenant will pay a premium over market price because they don't want to move. So this is if the tenant doesn't want to move. And let's say you you say, gee, I'm tired of dealing with this tenant. Um, I've had the property for 10 years. I just want to sell it. I'm going to pick up the phone and see if the tenant wants to buy it. Okay. The, the hard part there is, do you seek to list it on the multiple listing service? And here's the problem is you have a tenant. So you have um, a, an occupied property if somebody other than the tenant buys the property, they're going to have to move out. And that like precipitates a whole other host of problems. We're still in the COVID era and getting somebody out of a property. I don't even know if you can do it. Okay. And there are a lot of cities now are coming out with rules where they're suspend the cities, the municipalities are suspending evictions. I don't know how realistic it is to sell a property that's occupied by a tenant by somebody who wants to move in there. Right. So that's a real, that's a real world kind of contemporaneous issue. Um, but Forget, let's say you set that all aside. Let's say you're watching this COVID's over, hopefully. Do you list it or do you not list it, right? You have a tenant in there. Is there, how are you gonna inspect the property? How are you gonna show the property? Will you have an open house? These are all issues that um, really you need to think about. And in many instances, people just sell it to the tenant. They're like, I don't wanna deal with it, right? If that tenant's willing to pay market price, fine, done. I, it's not worth it to me. Um, so. Is this done by a real estate lawyer specialist? Uh, Amir asks. Yeah, you know, most lawyers, I would say real estate lawyers handle these transactions. Our firm handles these, handles these transactions. Ours are typically coupled with somebody dying, quite frankly, uh, because we're a trust and estates firm, but we'd certainly do it for somebody who's, where no one's died. Uh, but yeah, it's typically as a real estate firm uh, who's going to handle that. Um, but I would say that that it would be our firm, a firm that's similarly situated. The benefit, of course, is I'm a, a licensed broker as well. So that I think that helps. And many lawyers who are in real estate are licensed brokers. Nancy asks, we have a tenant who would like to buy our property, which is in a trust. We do not wish to sell until the passing of my mother, who's 90. Can we structure an option to buy in this situation? Can we receive a premium on rent? Will this trigger a reassessment? Will we still be able to benefit from step up and basis? Nancy, I think the answer to all of that is yes. I think you can have the best of all worlds. I think you can secure a higher rent from the tenant. The issue you're going to face is the state rent control. I'm assuming that's a single family residence. Uh, you do have, I'm not, this is probably getting into legal advice, but if you saw a webinar we did a couple of weeks ago on uh, trying to evict a tenant and the new uh, rent control law in California, the landlord is required to serve the tenant with a notice of exemption from rent control, because I think if you have a tenant and you seek to increase rent as kind of part of the um, lease option to buy, you have to draft that very carefully because you are now capped in California. You can never raise rents more than 10%. Okay. That's a statutory cap now. And, uh, but condos and single family residences are exempt, but you must serve notice of exemption on the tenant. Um, and it's the same, Nancy, it's a single family residence. So I think you could completely, um, you're not in a rent control location. Uh, so single family residents, again, are exempt from, uh, from uh, the rent control law, but you have to serve notice that, that they're exempt. So very, very important. So example here, Oscar owner, uh, leases Green Acres to Ted, the tenant who operates an on-premises car wash, and there's no option to buy here. Ted has an unfavorable lease. Actually, this came up this week. I was talking to a good friend of mine who's a lawyer, and he this is one of his situations. And uh, and the tenant here, he's he's overpaying on rent. He's like, you know what? Interest rates are so low. I'm overpaying on rent. I'm willing to overpay, right? So I'm willing to overpay on this property. So I'm relieved of this unfavorable lease, this overmarket lease. Okay. And now interest rates are lower. So when this um, lease was signed many, many years ago, there were escalators. Now we're in a lower interest rate environment. So we're seeing this with a lot of older leases, but this is an opportunity for the landlord to, um, for Oscar to sell the property and get a premium because if he waits until the lease is up, he's not gonna be able to sell the property for as much, okay? Because he's essentially accelerating the future payments on that unfavorable lease to Ted, which is very favorable to Oscar, Oscar's uh, essentially cashing out on that lease. Um, on a lease option, isn't the overmarket rent negotiable to uh, apply the overmarket rent towards the down at the time of purchase? Uh, it can. 
Um, sometimes that overmarket rent, uh, thank you, Anita, <coughs> Anita, is used uh, to essentially, uh, it's kind of like a layaway on a house where, you, you know, back in the day when you would lay away things for Christmas, you'd go to the department store. I mean, that seems so archaic, uh, but essentially it's like a layaway of a house. But sometimes it's just, um, it doesn't even apply to down. It depends on the situation. So um, property not listed. So we're not talking about property listed on the multiple listing service. I will tell you, and I, the reason I'm repeating this is I don't want you to watch this and say, I don't want to pay the commission and uh, I'm somehow going to game the system and I'm going to get all these benefits without paying the piper, so to speak. Okay. That doesn't really exist. All right. Real estate professionals uh, are in business because they add value to the, to the situation. So I will say if you're selling, um, if you want to get the maximum dollar amount on the price, so this is not if you're kind of locked in on a lease option to buy, it's not if you're in an estate situation, but if you're just selling it out into the, putting it out into the ether and selling it, you are much, much better off, much better off exposing it as broadly as you can to the market uh, because if, if you want to get the highest price. Okay, so this is not, and, and I got to tell you, people call me and they'll say, Jim, I'd like to sell the property. I'm going to do this inside deal. And I talk a lot of people out of it because I say, you know what? Don't hire us. You need to go hire a real estate professional and market this property because you're going to trip over a dollar saving a nickel. Okay. So what I mean by that is, you know, this is kind of penny wise and pound foolish. Um, and especially right now, we're in a very hot real estate market. Who knows what the price, the, what the values of properties are? We, you know, we, it, we just don't know until we get it out into the, um, into the ether. So Sally wants to sell her house to Bob, the next door neighbor. Bob lowballs Sally. What that means is, you know, Sally says, I think my property is worth a million bucks. Bob's like, well, I'll give you 750. That's a lowball offer. Okay. In this situation, Sally should consider listing the property on the multiple listing service. Why? Bob's going to see that sign go up next door. He's going to see the listing price at a million. And, you know, th things are starting to move and he might come up on his price. Okay. So that might be a reason uh, for Sally rather going back and forth with Bob and kind of ending up somewhere in the middle you know, in the eights, the high eights or low nines, she puts it on in the MLS. Sure, she's going to pay a 5% commission or whatever the commission is, but um, she's going to end up with more money in her pocket uh, after. So Melissa asks, can you discuss buying a property from a neighbor from the buyer's point of view? No deceased parties involved. Ooh, Melissa, sure. Um, so from the buyer's point of view, you don't want them listing it on the MLS, right? You want to be really, really nice and tell them how much you, you know, you love their house and how it's this legacy. And, uh, you know, it, it used to be, and this is actually a recent change, people would write a letter with, with um, an offer. Now, the, um, that is viewed as a violation of the Fair Housing Act, actually. So it used to be people would say, oh, you know, uh, I'm going to move in here with my wife and our three children and, you know, and all this information that really it's illegal to even communicate that on the, on the sales professional side. So you can't tell somebody, you know, who's buying the property. You can't say if, if they're a married couple, if they're uh, single, if they have children or, you know, um, ethnic background or whatever it is, the, these are very, um, very important rules that seek to unwind, frankly, hundreds of years of discrimination in, in our country that we're just now kind of uh, hopefully getting through. So these are very serious um, um, considerations. That being said, if you know the neighbor, the neighbor knows you, you, the neighbor will have knowledge of you and that might play to your benefit. Okay. So regardless of, of um, you know, whatever the situation is, you are, I think you're much better off not having the property on the MLS, quite frankly. So that's from the buyer's standpoint. So let's talk about residential, um, multifamily, commercial, industrial, and ag. So Residential, when I say residential, I'm saying a single family resident up to sub residents up to four units. Um, so the, the single family residents to four units is one class of property. And frankly, in my mind, there's that and there's everything else. Okay. So these are generally listed on the multiple listing service. Everything else includes multifamily, commercial, industrial, ag. Um, I want to talk about capitalization or cap rates. What is a capitalization rate? You can think of it as like the interest you would get on a CD. That's the closest analogy. Capitalization rate indicates the expected rate of return on a real estate investment property. And we do that by computing, by taking the net income and dividing it by the, um, 
the value of the property. So on a CD, if you put $100,000 in a CD and you get $1,000 in interest, you 1,000 divided by 100,000 is 1%. So the cap rate on a CD is 1%. See how this is working. It's essentially your net income. Um, and it's expressed as a percentage. So this estimates the future uh, rate of return. Now, something you need to be aware of, these are capitalization rates. On the left-hand side is 2015, and on the right-hand side is 2021, and that number's going down. In fact, a lot, okay? It's gone down 10%. That's a big move, okay? Maybe a little over 10%. What this means is you have to pay more money to get the same amount of rental income. Stated another way, you get less rental income for the amount of property that you buy today than you did six years ago. Okay, so something to know is that we are in a declining capitalization rate. Something else I want you to look at is how high that is. Are you getting 5.2%, 5.3% on your money in a CD? No, right? So let's look at an example. Let's say the Santa Barbara multifamily home is valued at $10 million. Net rents, $200 a year. This is net, not net of um, interest or principal on the mortgage. What we're talking about is property taxes, maintenance, insurance, vacancy, whatever. Okay. So this is just the straight return on the money that you put in. 200,000 divided by 10 million is a 2% cap rate. 2% um, is terrible, people. That's terrible. It's way below the 5.3% national average. However, historically, property in Santa Barbara has done what? It has not gone down, right? It's gone up. So in this sense, it's kind of more like a growth stock. So you say, look, I know property in Santa Barbara is probably going to be worth more 10 years from now than it is today. So I'm willing to suck it up and get lower income because I know that my, uh, my property is appreciating. This is straight line depreciation. Now, um, commercial property is straight line depreciation over a 40 year period. So the sale of the property. So what happens? You sell the property and then you do a 1031 exchange. Now 1031 I'm using as a verb or a noun here, a 1031 exchange into a $20 million property. So the property sold and now you buy a $20 million property. Uh, you opt out of your straight line depreciation through cost segregation and your 1031 into your new property gives you about a four to four and a quarter percent uh, rate of return. And this is in a professionally managed portfolio where you're not doing anything. You're investing the money and you're getting a mailbox money, okay? Your after-tax in income is significantly increased. And the advantage is that money that you're getting now, because you've taken on more debt, gives you more basis, you have more depreciation. Now, how do you sell the $10 million property? Well, you negotiate a price and make a deal with a commissioned real estate professional. Without a commissioned real estate professional, if you find somebody, starts with a letter of intent, followed by uh, a purchase agreement, escrow instructions. You can save up to three hundred fifty thousand in commissions. Uh, again, if it's not a known buyer, I would would market the property, and we'll kind of walk through how you market a property of of this size. But if you have a known buyer, you know, uh, let's take Hal and Wanda. They want to sell their Santa Barbara multifamily to a local investor. Person's been knocking on their door for years. Knock, knock, knock. Hey, knock, knock, knock. I want to buy your place. They agree on a price. When they do their 1031 exchange, when they sell this $10 million property and buy the $20 million property, they're going from $200,000 a year to $450,000 a year in income. And most of this is going to be not subject to income tax because of the additional, because when they go into that that professionally managed portfolio of properties. And we have a webinar on this on our YouTube page. If they go into that professionally managed portfolio of properties, they get more basis and they can depreciate it over a seven to 10 year period. Okay, so I know I'm going through this a little fast, but Hal and Wanda are so relieved because uh, they've had this place for years. They're tired of leaky faucets, clogged toilets and tenants that don't pay their rent. So, um, so on commercial and industrial, without a known buyer, so if you just say, look, I don't know who's going to buy this place. Uh, I would encourage you to contact the, the local manager of a commercial real estate brokerage. Okay. And, and the reason you contact the manager 
is you describe your property. You say, look, I've got this piece of property, a wine storage facility in Lodi. We've got an example. Uh, who is the best, who's the best person for this? Because what happens in commercial real estate, you, you get this to an extent in residential, but more so in commercial and industrial. People get siloed. They do. I handle these types of properties and I, I know the market. I know the buyers. I know what these properties are trading for. Um, it's really important on the commercial and industrial to pick the right sales professional, right? And um, ask who would be a good fit for the listing broker. So they're going to match you up. You know, if you're the wine storage guy or, or gal, they're going to match you up with the right person. And, um, and then they also conduct research, which is very important. And the, your major houses out there, Keller Williams Commercial, CBRE, JLL, Cushman, Colliers, uh, those are some of the, the major houses that are out there. And um, uh, Anita, thank you on establishing value. You can do an appraisal. You know, you can establish value by an appraisal. That is absolutely correct. The only challenge with appraisals is they're looking at, at comparable sales going six months backwards. And if you're in a hot market, you might be undervaluing your property. Uh, sim Anonymous asked, similar to Nancy's question, if a single family residence is sold while both spouses are living and the property has a significant capital gain, is an installment sale to minimize capital gains taxes worthy of consideration, particularly if capital gains taxes increase this year? Any comments on structuring such a transaction? An installment sale does work. You have to find a third party to handle it. Um, and one challenge is that's an unregulated space. So um, I would just, uh, there are some other options that we can do, but certainly look at it, but you got to go with a reputable person. There's, there is a, um, a strategy out there and a few people who are selling the strategy that's coming under intense pressure from the IRS. Uh, and there's a right way to do it and there's a wrong way to do it. And if you do it wrong, you're going to end up in a tussle with the IRS. Uh, who's a professional managing agency, property manager, or REIT type program? So Anita, when I'm talking about professionally managed portfolios of property, there are a variety of privately traded REITs. That's what I'm talking about. Not a publicly traded REIT, and it's structured as a trust, so you can effectuate a 1031 exchange and go from uh, your property to a portfolio of properties. And that is, it's like a tenancy in common, the structure is, but they overlay it with a trust. So you can't have one tenant in common uh, op, say, hey, I want out and bring down the whole ship. You have a trustee in charge who says, nope, if, hey, once you put this money in, you're in for the seven to 10 year term. Uh, and that's the way it is. Uh, I'm interested, Charles, hey, Charles, how you doing? I'm interested in out of state commercial property. Can you review a draft LOI? Uh, sure, uh, LOI is fine. Um, and we can take a look at that. Uh, depends on what state it's in. Uh, many of our lawyers are licensed in other states, but certainly uh, I know we're, we've got an open matter with you. We can certainly take a look at that. And congratulations on, on looking at that property. Uh, so so how, does, how does a commercial transaction happen? It often starts with a letter of intent. So a little bit different than residential. Residential tips typically starts with an offer. And in California, we use the California Association of Realtors forms and we write up the offer, okay? Typically in commercial and industrial, it starts with the letter of intent. And what the letter of intent does is it, it's a rough out of the, um, the uh, big, big rocks in the deal, like price, close, down payment, uh, when, your, when your deposit might become a hard deposit and an, a non-refundable deposit. So these real key elements. Um, and then after the LOI, I would say that 90% of California commercial realtors use the air forms or the car forms. And generally they're the air forms. These are the standard agreement and escrow instructions. You can use attorney drafted forms. The nice thing about the air forms, quite frankly, is they're very neutral. They're not favoring one side or another. And, you know, you can play hide the ball. You can play, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to try and, you know, trick people into doing something, but, you know, come on, that, that's not how it should be. We should be forthcoming and truthful and transparent to get a deal done, right? I think that's how you're going to get the highest price. If you start hiding stuff, um, you know, I guess without a good reason to hide it, but if you're hiding stuff, I think uh, oftentimes only bad comes, comes out of that. So, uh, but uh, I, I favor transparency. I think I can make the case where you wouldn't be transparent, but I'm just speaking extremely generally here. So um, commercial industrial property. So let's look at Blue Acre. Um, so Blue Acre, Hal and Wanda, husband and wife want to sell Blue Acre and it's a wine storage facility in Lodi. A wine storage facility 
is a facility where, you know, you're a winemaker and you make a bunch of wine, you make a million bottles of wine, you got to put it somewhere, right? They're all over California wine storage facilities. They look like big concrete blocks, okay? Um, Want to sell this wine storage facility in Lodi with net rents of 120,000. So very poor cap rate, 1.2% cap rate. For whatever reason, it's just low. The inside sale falls through. You know, the tenant might not be paying their bill. Who knows what's going on? Uh, they might have written a bad lease where the, the landlord has to pay the power on wine storage in Lodi. It's probably 110 degrees in Lodi today, right? You, you can get stuck in these bad leases, okay? So um, they want to get out. The inside sale falls through. Uh, Hal and Wanda, they're like, okay, Lodi, we're in Sacramento. They call the Sacramento office um, of, a, of a national um, a commercial real estate brokerage. And the Sacramento manager identifies the person in the Central Valley, Sacramento Valley, right? Identifies the person to handle uh, wine storage sales. That person happens to be in Modesto where Gallo is headquartered, right? That's where a lot of wine business, uh, Napa and Modesto, a lot of wine business happens there. And so um, that Modesto broker uh, researches the property and the property commands a premium, okay? Because that person knows, hey, I know this other person who's willing to pay a premium for whatever reason because they're in that market. And so the point in kind of getting granular on wine storage and location is you may think, oh, I'm going to hire this person that is in this physical location that's near my building, but Modesto and Loda are pretty far away, okay? You need to find the best person, right? Because this is not, um, this is not so much like residential real estate, it's a slightly different animal. And I think the best way to get the, the, the best top price is to go through that, uh, the manager at the, at the local, um, at, at the local national brokerages. So um, sells for 10.8 million. How long am I going to 1031 the property into a professionally managed portfolio of properties? They go from 120,000 a year and the headaches to 459,000 a year. Mailbox money. Mailbox money is the money that appears in your mailbox. And all you have to do is walk out and get the check. Well, actually it's, you know, deposited in your account. That is mailbox money. Helen Wanda are so relieved they're making more money. They have greater depreciation. Remember, they 1031 this $10 million property into a $20 million portfolio. So most of that $459,000 is not subject to income tax. Very, very important. Um, and they don't have to deal with a difficult tenant. So let's answer some questions and then we'll cover 1031 foot, foot pitfalls. Um, what is the definition of a primary residence? If a buyer agrees to rent back to a seller, is there a cap on the length of time they can do so, so as to not disqualify property as a primary residence? My question is the context of Prop 19, age 55 owners seeking to preserve tax bases. Melissa, that's a really good question. Um, if a buyer agrees to rent back to a seller, the change in ownership occurs when the seller sells the property to the buyer. And uh, there would be a change in ownership, so the property would be reassessed. And then the Prop 19, the preserving your tax base is what Melissa is asking is when you sell up when you're 55 and over and you sell a property in California, you can move your primary residence, you can move your tax base. There is a time limit on that. I'm going off memory. It's, I think it's two years. It might be three. I'm just going off memory on that. It's statutory. We handle this a lot with clients. In fact, now that I'm thinking about it, it may be two full years. It might be three, but I think it's two. I would just have to double check it. Um, I guess is what happens when you've been doing something 27 years, you kind of doubt your, your own knowledge, but uh, there's a time limit on it, but yeah, you can do it. So you can sell your primary residence and rent back and a year later buy a replacement residence. Sure. No problem. Anita asks, are non-refundable monies, non-refundable legal and commercial transactions? Uh, yeah. So there's a difference. So that's when a deposit becomes hard on a commercial transaction. Uh, in the context, but um, much different in a residential, a lot more consumer protections. So 1031 pitfalls. Um, we have a whole webinar on 1031s. Here's the deal. You have two stopwatches. Imagine you have <laughs> two stopwatches, one in each hand. In the left hand is the 45-day stopwatch. That stops and starts, stops and starts, stops and starts, right? So I sell a property and I want to do a 1031 exchange. I want to exchange it for like property. Uh, another like property, I have 45 days to identify a property. What does that mean? Well, I sell my property on a Monday. 
identify a property on a Wednesday, boom, two days are gone. Okay. And then two weeks later, that property falls through escrow while well, that 45 day clock starts again. The 180 days, the six months, is you have to close within six months. Now, six months may seem like a long time, but I am telling you, just getting an appraisal now is uh, is frustrating. Uh, it's it's very difficult to close a transaction, uh, a 1031 exchange in a short period of time. There's possible elimination of 1031 under Biden. Um, kind of scary new world if that happens, but. Um, I'm not sure the effect it will have on providing affordable housing in California. I'm really worried about that. Um, something else to understand with 1031s. In a 1031, you use an accommodator. So if I'm selling a property to you and I give you the property, the money that you give me doesn't go to me and then I do a 1031 exchange. It goes to a third party accommodator. They are unlicensed. And I would say, you know, if you're a lawmaker in California, not that I want you to pass more regulation, this is probably something that really should be regulated, okay? Because accommodators do leave with the money. They do go bankrupt. What happens to your money? You're chasing somebody after the money. If you're going to use an accommodator, API is based out of Roseville. I think they're the nation's largest accommodator. I think they have about $2 billion in assets at any time. Uh, uh, First American Title has uh, an accommodator, so I would I would attach I would use the accommodators that are in the larger companies. Don't use like Joe's Accommodation Service, okay? Uh, because that's unregulated. I'd just be very very careful with that. A uh, drop and swap in California. Uh, I'm going to explain what this is. This is one of these pitfalls. It's one of these gotchas. California has a lot of gotchas, um, but here's here's a drop and swap. Abel and Baker by Green Acre in 1990. Abel and Baker transfer Greenacre to LLC in 2000. They've been partners for 31 years. Abel and Baker, they're like, you know what? We're just going to part ways. I'm going to do a 1031 exchange on our, on our respective halves. Now, the LLC can effectuate a 1031 exchange, but that's not solving the problem because now they're still in the LLC together because Abel and Baker, they want to split the sheets. They want to go, not, they're not mad at each other. They just, you know, they just want to go their separate ways. And so Abel and Baker drop Greenacre out of the LLC to Abel and Baker individually. And then the following week, they effectuate a 1031. Something you need to understand, California will likely disallow this 1031, okay? And you have to allow the property to be seasoned. This is, a, this is something that um, kind of falls between the, the cracks, the, the gaps in knowledge of accountants, CPAs, and, and real estate professionals. It's a real estate professionals who know about this because they're the ones who get the call from their client you know, a year later. They're like, what, why did you let me pull, drop this property out of, the, out of the LLC and swap it? So just be un, un, understand the drop and swap out of the LLC and doing a quick 1031 exchange, not, uh, it's pretty risky strategy. Uh, Armin asks, if a trust expressly gives one child the option to purchase the parent's residence who died pre-prop 19, would the trust still need to obtain a loan to pay off the siblings, or can one child obtain a traditional loan that funds concurrently with the transfer of the property from the trust to the child? Armin, great question. We have a whole webinar on that. Uh, it's buying out a sibling. The answer to the question, and you don't need to watch the webinar, but you're welcome to, the answer to the question is the trust must borrow the money. The child cannot buy the property from the trust. If the child buys the property from the trust, that will result in, in a partial reassessment. So go ahead and call us. That's a trust administration matter. Either Rochelle or Lisa in our office, they're two attorneys. Rochelle is my partner. Um, either one of them can help you with that. Um, follow up. Melissa says, follow up. Sorry if I was not clear. I meant the seller sells the house with a contingency of renting the home back from the new buyer for some period. Is there a cap on how long the new owner can rent back to the seller so as not to jeopardize their primary residence status? Melissa, that the issue on primary residence with Prop 19, this is very, very important. It's when the property is sold, is it the primary residence of the seller? If it is, that clock starts, that two or three year clock, and I want to say it's two, but it might be three. That time period starts when the property sells. So when we say primary residence, we're only talking about homeowners. So when you sell your property, I mean, it's like capital P, capital R primary residence, right? And I see where you're going with it because they sold it, but they're still occupying it as their residence. 
that does not fit the legal definition of primary residence. Primary residence is an owner-occupied residence, okay, for, for the purposes of Prop 19. I hope that answers your question. Uh, let's talk about a $100 million real estate portfolio. Some clients have a $100 million real estate portfolio, and they want to sell it. Uh, folks, this is a big deal, and I don't care what market you're in. This is a big deal, okay? Uh, this is a significant holding. Um, oftentimes, it will not be one building. It will be multiple buildings. So Helen wanted to call the managing director of various offices, and this is important. If you have a big one, if you have a big portfolio, even if you got a small one, don't call one, call a lot, you know, shop it, right? Describe the portfolio that they're selling and ask the manager who's the best fit to put together a proposal for the portfolio. That being said, and in this one, it would likely be a team, you know, if you've got industrial and commercial and multifamily, probably going to be several different people. And you might be able to, to do a deal. You might be able to get a, a break on your commission, quite frankly, because on this size, there, you know, there's, that's a negotiation. Although, um, you know, I'm not a fan of beating people up on fees because I want them to do a good job, right? So, um, but ask them who's the best fit to put the proposal together and shop it to different different locations. But sometimes it's best not to sell a portfolio because sometimes the sum of the parts can be greater than the whole. What I mean by that is people who buy a portfolio of $100 million oftentimes expect a, a discount because look, I'm just buying the single slug of property. I want you to get, give a little bit and discount. And some people say, well, if I sold these onesie twosie, I might end up with more money in my pocket. Uh, and I think that's case by case uh, specific, but you know, do Hal and Wanda really wanna deal with multiple transactions? If this is 20 properties, I don't know if they want to deal with 20 escrows. I don't, I mean, that's a lot of work, right? Uh, or you could sell the portfolio in tranches or slices and some to known buyers, some to third-party buyers. It's kind of a whole uh, mix of, of transactions. So, you know, you might sell 30 million to uh, put that on the market and you might sell 50 million on an inside deal and another 20, um, you know, some other way. So again, this is case specific and requires mindfulness. I would say from the human side, it's a gut check. What level of stress do you want to live, lead with your life? How long do they really want to deal with it or not? Um, those are non-economic questions. Um, so just something to be mindful of. So uh, sale of LLC versus the underlying real estate. Okay, I will tell you that in the world of aircraft and boats, these are boats that are licensed, uh, typically ocean-going vessels that are uh, Coast Guard registry. You will often see, now this personal property, not rental property, you will oftentimes see an aircraft or a boat in an LLC, what is sold are the shares of the LLC, not the vessel or the aircraft. And the reason is people are trying to bypass sales tax is the bottom line, okay? So whenever you sell a property, you pay sales tax, but if you sell LLC units, it's an intangible. There's no sales tax tax if you buy a share of Apple, right? But let's say Helen Wanda put Yellow Acre in, into an LLC. And Helen Wanda, Helen Wanda want to sell the LLC to a buyer, not the property, but the LLC selling a security, the LLC units is different than selling the underlying real estate and uh, can require oftentimes does require a securities license. Okay. So it's a different type of transaction. Typically realtors are not securities licensed. And so how and Wanda actually end up selling this underlying real estate, not the LLC shares. Um, one thing we've talked about on other webinars is original owner status. So if you have somebody who acquired a, a rental property, a multifamily with an LLC in 1990, if you do it right, the property won't be reassessed. And that's a very important consideration. So this is another reason why you would want to involve, maybe not have an on market, but why you would have to, why you would want an off market transaction, because the seller in preserving that Prop 13 in that transaction may command a higher price, okay? Essentially an above market price to fact, factor in the future tax savings, okay? So if you're following that, great. If you're not, we have a lot of, uh, a lot of information on Prop 13 uh, and keeping your low property tax base. So lastly, uh, what is an escrow company? And if you guys have any questions, go ahead and start writing those in there. I'll answer those as we kind of wrap it up. Uh, what is an escrow company? So it's commonly used in real estate transactions in California and other states, but not all states. In some states, a lawyer is the one who serves as the intermediary. It holds the money and the documents between the parties, and it's a neutral third party that helps facilitate this, the sale of real estate. It avoids what is called the Mexican standoff, right? 
And that's where, you know, you've seen this a lot in movies where it's a bunch of people standing in a circle pointing pistols at each other and no one's going to make the first move because anyone that exits that, that problem is, is going to, is going to lose. Okay. Um, Zutzwang is a, is a chess term from German, which means any move you make is, is a bad move. Um, so the, the idea here with the escrow company is it solves that problem of, I got the money, you got the property and you're kind of looking at each other like, well, who's going to make the first move. Um, but I would say that an escrow company is a tremendous asset. Okay. They do a ton of work and, um, they make sure all the I's are dotted and the T's are crossed. If you are getting uh, purchase money financing, there's a next level amount of compliance. Um, the other thing that you get typically in a sale that you do not get in a distribution from a trust is title insurance. And this is very important. Who knows what liens have been placed on the property, right? Before you buy a piece of property, it's a really good idea to get a policy of title insurance. So that's another component and that is handled to, uh, through the escrow process. So who do you turn to? We do have private real estate transactions in our firm. We do help clients with that. Um, and we, we help them shepherd them through the process in, in the situations that I've described, you can go to our website and you can request an appointment, uh, in the up, upper right-hand side. And if you say, Hey, Jim, I've got this deal. And I know a couple of people, um, on, on, with our time here together have, have said, Hey, I've got some issues, go ahead and request an appointment and we can go ahead and meet with you and see if we can, if we can help. And if we can't add value you know, we're not going to do anything, but if we can help, you know, certainly we're ready, willing, and able to help you go ahead, subscribe to our YouTube channel, and I will open it up to questions. Anonymous says any updates uh, on the California Senate and assembly bills related to Prop 19. The Senate bill SB 668 as of, well, it looks like it's dead in the water. Uh, we might get out, you know, like the clear the paddles to bring it back. I don't know. Uh, it just did not get the support in the Senate that I was hoping for. Uh, and assembly, the assembly bill is the Assembly Constitutional Amendment 9. Uh, that uh, is, would be an amendment to the Constitution. I suspect this is going to come back by ballot initiative, if I had to guess. The problem is 50% of Californians are renters. I don't know that you're going to get the votes on that. So um, Craig asks, we have no kids. Should I consider my home to be in an LLC? Typically, LLCs are um, for business purposes only. So if you put your home in an LLC, you lose your homeowner's exemption. You should pay yourself rent. Most people don't put their residence in an LLC. Um, if you're a famous person, there are some workarounds. If you don't want your name on your trust, or you don't want your name on your deed, uh, or title the documents. So if you have a level of fame uh, or notoriety, there is a way to anonymize, uh, your assets and kind of fly under the radar. So you're not, you're not, stuff's not coming up on public data search. Uh, Caleb says, I see you're discussing California real estate market futures next week. What can we expect? Ooh, that's a good one, Caleb. We have three webinars back to back. Super exciting. Uh, Bay Area, Northern California, LA, and the capital region. We did one about a year ago and people said, well, I'm in Pasadena. I don't really care what happens up in Bay Area. So we're going more local. And we're going to focus on the current uh, real estate uh, climate, right? I mean, it's up. Everything's up. Uh, we're going to be focusing on that um, on our next series of webinars next week. Thank you, Caleb. Uh, Ernie says, I notified my tenant during the last lease renewal that I will be selling the single family residence at the end of that renewal term. Is the tenant obligated to vacate at the end of the term, or are they now protected under the new eviction constraint laws or policies? Ernie, I don't know. It probably depends on the city that you're in. Um, that's something where I would check with your, uh, if you're going, it sounds like you're going to list it on the multiple listing service. I would check with your realtor, right? Because the realtors, these are real estate professionals. They stay on top of this stuff. That's a classic example, Ernie, where you would, if you're going to sell it to a third party, somebody you don't even know, please use a real estate professional, put it on the MLS. And the real estate professional should be able to tell you pretty much right away what, how that would work. Anonymous asks, do you have any attorneys in your office who can handle a private sale of a trust property in Washington state? Um, I believe so. One of our lawyers is getting currently getting licensed in Washington, um, but uh, I don't think we have anybody currently, but we could certainly refer you to somebody. Russell asks, will letters to our senators to support SB 668 help or is it too late? No, you need to get on, seriously people, Russell, 
we just sent an email out to all our people, all the people on our email list about a week ago saying, here's the link to your assembly, your member of the assembly or state senator. And you do it by, you can send a letter, but typically it's, you know, electronic. Now you basically send them an email. Uh, but yeah, voice your support because this is a, I got to tell you something. This is terrible. Okay. This is terrible for affordable housing. I can't tell you how many people I talk to that say, I live in the Bay Area or I live in LA or I live in San Diego. The house is worth $3 million. I mean, this is nothing else, right? It's worth $3 million. The assessed value is 300. And they're going to have to move because they can't afford the property taxes because not everyone has a job where they make 500,000 a year or a million a year. You know, some people actually make 80,000 a year or 50. Those people are going to have to sell that house and they're going to have to move. And, you know, there's something that's right about that, especially when it comes to the family home. So I would certainly voice your support. I'll get off the soapbox. But uh, Adam says, uh, tuned in late, would like a copy of the recording. How do I get it? Uh, it's going to be on YouTube here. Uh, not sure when, maybe later today, tomorrow. Nancy asks, any chance you will start webinars that affect San Diego? Uh, Nancy, we don't have offices in the San Diego market yet, um, but certainly we will put that uh, on there. In fact, we may just want to add it. I don't know, but uh, the San Diego market, uh, definitely a great market. I happen to be a San Diego na native, so I'm a little, little biased, uh, but thank you for the question. And if there are no further questions, we will wrap it up. Oh, there's one. Anonymous asks, if you have multiple owners in an LLC, not family for a property, can you set up a structure where you, if one person wants to sell or leave, you can divide it in shares essentially? Yes, Anonymous, there's a way to do that. And you might even be able to avoid or delay reassessment. So it's very important to hire somebody who knows what they're doing, which would be our firm uh, or any other you know, reputable firm, but uh, there aren't many of us out there and we kind of all know each other. So uh, anyway, um, Anita, thank you. And Sean, uh, great, great to uh, thank you for the thank yous and have a great day and tune in next week. We've got our three real estate webinars. Have a great day.